My button's pressed. Yes. Yeah, it's, I, it's yeah, it's not my first video. I know these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to bring to order the March 25th meeting of the uh, Tiverton Town Council. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States, States of America, America. to the Republic for which it stands. Under God. So Chris is running his home over there. <laughs> Jeannie. Roll call. President De Medeiros. Present. Vice President Burke. Present. Councillor Edwards. Present. Councillor Edwards V. Present. Councillor Janik. Present. Councillor Paul. Present. Councillor Milburn is absent. Consent agenda. Approval of Town Council Minutes, March 11, 2024, regular meeting. Councillor Milburn abstains, absent. March 11, 2024, executive session. Council Milburn abstains, absent. Acknowledge receipts of minutes from boards, commissions, and committees. The personnel board, one. The litter control, one. Board of canvases, one. Zoning revision committee, one. Harbor commission, one. Acknowledge receipts and reports. Denise Charette, town treasurer, February 2024, budget and revenue reports. Town of Warren, resolution opposing H7983, creating the Office of State Building Commissioner. Two, Town of Charleston, resolution opposing any revival of the old Saybrook to Kenyon bypass. Town of Charleston, resolution supporting amendments to RIJL, GL452438, general provisions, substantive lots of record. Town of Charleston, Resolution reporting H7462 amendments to the Energy Facility Sitting Act. Town of Charleston. Resolution supporting H7688 regarding state hotel tax distribution formula. Town of Hopkins. Resolution opposing any revival of the old Saybrook to Kenyon bypass. Town of Hopkins. Resolution opposing H7693, S2361, and s 2 373 related to real estate convenience tax. Town of Hopkin, resolution opposing H7681 uh, related to tax valuation freeze on affordable housing. Town of Hopkin, resolution opposing, opposing H7651 related to low income housing 8% alternate tax rate. Town of Hopkin, resolution H7378 related to homestead exemption. Town of Hopkins, resolution of poison S2018, 2018, related to levy and assessment of local taxes. Town of Hopkins, resolution opposing H7981, relating to zoning ordinances. Town of Hopkins, resolution of poison H7980, related to mob mobile and manufactured homes. Bay Street neighborhood roadways, 20. 24 ELUR inspection, Bay Street Neighborhood, Park 2024 ELUR inspection. Approval of Narragansett Electric Verizon Joint Poll Petition for Poll 48-84 near 20 Forever Drive. Approval of Narragansett Electric Verizon Joint Poll Petition for Poll 119-7 on Bouchon Lane. Would any of the councilors like to withdraw anything from the agenda? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, D1. Councilor Burke? 4B5. Anyone else? I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda, taking out B5 and D1. So moved. Second. Motion been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? B5, Harbor Commission. So just a note um, on the second page of the Harbor Commission minutes, it references um, Representative Jay Edwards' uh, bill regarding the proposed, uh, well, the area around Sapalit Marsh and protecting that. 
Um, the Senate counterpart, 2415, is up in um, Housing and Municipal Government Committee in the Senate this Thursday. So if anyone wishes to go and speak um, for it, I think it's probably good that some council members go if they can and or the administrator and I sent it to Bruce Cox to, to make him aware. What time, Mike? Uh, well, it's at what's called the rise. So the rise is any time after the Senate gets out of session. I think it's at the rise. I'll double check. They may not have a session that night, so they may start earlier. For D1, Town of Warren. Uh, yeah, I just think that uh, we should join Warren in opposing this legislation. So um, with that, I'll motion that we uh, accept 4B5 and D1. Do you want to talk more about 4D1 and vote to? Well, we can't vote on anything, so I'll just mention it now, and then we can bring it back up if we want to draft a similar one. I'll talk to the so, lawyer. So you want me to put it on the next agenda? Yeah. I have a motion to approve. 4B5 and 4D1. Do second. I have a second? Second. Motion to remain second. Any further discussion? I can't see all of you, so if you get my attention if you want to do something. Uh, motion to remain in second. All those in favor? Jeannie, can you, Jeannie, can you see everybody? <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll let you know if, yeah. I'll, let you know what the vote is. <laughs> Public comments. Um, so I have five right now. Anyone else would like to speak that did not sign up? Okay. Catherine, three new community partnerships at Tiverton Public Library. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Catherine. Um, hi. So I just wanted to advertise that we have three new community partnerships at Cheverton Public Library, and I thought it would be this would be a great opportunity to advertise those. So the first is that we've connected with United Ways 211 service, and they will be bringing their RV to the library parking lot on um, starting in April on the second Friday of every month from 9.30 to 1. And this is a free and confidential service. They can assist with anything like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they have some cybersecurity assistance, um, also anything to do with the special needs emergency registry, which I know our fire departments and police departments use, um, singular. Fire Police Department. <laughs> um, and also any other, um, I believe they also help with like landlord disputes and um, along those lines. So that's really exciting that we have them coming and I hope that anybody who needs that assistance, they can contact us at the library for details um, or come on the second Friday of every month from 9.30 to 1. Um, up next is we are doing a pet supply donation drive in coordination with our neighbors, the dog park, and we're really excited for this event. It's going to be happening throughout April, and it's benefiting pe Family Pet Advocates, which is a local Tiverton organization. And so throughout the month of April, please feel free to, free, feel free to drop off um, mainly dry dog and cat food, canned dog can and cat food, and also cat litter. Those are the main items that they're asking for. Um, but any assistance helps, and they distribute at the Little Compton Food Pantry. Um, so it's really great that we're able to partner with the dog park committee on this and that we're doing something to help all of our neighbors um, and a great organization as well. And last but not least, Rhode Island Community Food Bank was recently at the library advertising that for those who are 60 and older and have certain requirements, um, they will get a free commodity supplemental food program box. And so it's a completely free food box for those who qualify. And um, we have plenty of information at the library of how to sign up. And um, we heard that only a limited number of Tiverton residents have taken advantage of this service. So we're trying to assist the food bank in getting as much information out as possible. So. Yeah, 
Am I on? Yeah. Catherine, um, just make sure all of this is on the town website because it would be terrific for everyone to see. And I have flyer packets for everyone um, that I can leave right on the stage here if you'd like to take. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike. And just thank you, Catherine. I think those are all really good. Um, 211 is a referral source. Yes. To, so people understand that they're not necessarily going to get the help right there, mm -hmm. but they're going to connect them to the appropriate agencies that can help with whatever the issue is. Yes. Thank yeah. you for that. All right, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Shannon McNamara. Her subject is Tibbet in Schools. Yes. Good evening. Um, first, I would like to thank the town council for moving the venue tonight um, so as many of us could come as possible. And second, I would like to thank my fellow citizens for showing up tonight. And I do implore you to continue showing up until we see this fight through. As I sat and listened during the school committee meeting March 12th and the parent forum last Tuesday the 19th, one common theme was brought up again and again by parents of this town. We came to Tiverton because of the quality of the schools and we chose to stay in Tiverton because of the quality of the schools. As I speak to you tonight, I want to make one thing clear. I am 100% for funding education, but this cannot be a blank check. We need to look at our budget and go item by item, just like we do in our homes. If these past weeks have made me realize anything, it is that I no longer trust the numbers coming in for what they are. I have never thought to ask for a line by line itemized budget from our schools, but now I do. Others' faith in our school system may be forever altered as we creep closer and closer to a decision by the school committee. If the only options being considered are the two by the superintendent, I fear our town will see more dollars lost because parents will choose to send their children elsewhere. I admit, even though I've been fighting to find a better solution, I too have looked elsewhere. I called Lil Compton to see about enrolling my children for next year and was told that they have been inundated with phone calls from Tiverton parents since the news broke. Tiverton already lost 65 students between 2022 and 2023. Between these students leaving to pursue their education elsewhere and a rise in valuation, this resulted in Tiverton losing almost $1.7 million in state aid. If this game of chicken between our school committee and our town council results in parents pulling their children, what will the numbers look like next year? What will the economic impact on our town be if we lose one of our best assets, a Blue Ribbon Elementary School ranked number three in the state? The answer to these questions may be found a few states south of us in Weldon, North Carolina. In recent years, Weldon has seen a population decline partly due to concerns about its school quality, including low academic performance and graduation rates. Families are opting to relocate to neighboring towns or larger cities with better school districts. This outmigration presents challenges for Weldon, such as reduced tax revenue, fewer local businesses, and a weakened sense of community. This should be the writing on the wall for my fellow Tiverton neighbors. We need to learn from Weldon and towns like it when we're looking at the two options presented by the superintendent to our school community and our community. What will this do to our education quality and ability to retain residents, attract new families, and foster long-term economic growth and stability? While there's no single study providing comprehensive evidence of the effects of low high school test scores specifically on economic growth in small towns, several studies and reports shed light on related aspects. If we continue down this path, Tiverton may face potential challenges in attracting investment due to its education quality. Research from various sources, including the Journal of Regional Science and the National Bureau of Economic Research, indicates that regions with better educational outcomes tend to attract more investment and experience higher rates of economic growth, while areas with lower educational attainment, such as those with low high school test scores, may see outmigration of skilled individuals. Reports from institutions like the Brookings Institute and the U.S. Department of Education emphasize the link between educational attainment income levels and funding allocations for schools, suggesting that persistent low test scores could perpetuate income disparities and hinder economic growth by leading to reduced resources for education. As a result, the cycle of inadequate funding tied to achievement could continue to impact Tiverton schools and its economic prospects. To this end, we need a thorough investigation into where our tax dollars are going. The people of Tiverton need to know each line item if the argument being presented is either give the district another $4.7 million or face years of economic and educational disparity. 
Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Shannon. Karen Efrain. Sure. Uh, sure. When I'm ready. Jamie French, would you like to wait till later or you want to do it now? No, no, no. Karen also put Rhode Island ready and she wants to wait till the topic comes. Come on, Jamie. Why I, why I wanted to talk tonight is that there's a lot of um, people here tonight. Like yeah, Jamie, Jamie just Clay, say your name and your Red address. Avenue. And that Rhode Island Ready, if people don't know, deals with the industrial park. And the industrial park was a business park. And uh, zoning, industry zoning, I believe, only has a 40-foot buffer. And that's the industrial park sits next to Stafford Pond, Ranger School, our middle school, and our high school. Anything that goes there can affect what happens in, with our drinking water or at our schools. If Rhode Island Ready is a pre-permitted program, I understand, and that means that if we go with them, we lose the right to have a say in what happens to that area. And that is a big concern to me, especially being by residential neighborhoods and the school system. But any, any manufacturing could create alluvial water issues with Stafford Pond, which is our drinking water. So I think that everyone here tonight really needs to stay and not leave after item one and two about the schools, but needs to stay and listen to item four and hear what Rhode Island Ready has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Jordan. Uh, you got to come up, honey. You can yeah, bring the kids if you want. Are you all right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's all right. Jordan, I just need your address. Yep, 13 Fieldstone Lane. Okay. Um, so this is more of a question pertaining to the, the potential closure of Fort Barton. Does the council have any speculation as to what might happen to a, a vacant school like Fort Barton once it closes? Because we've gotten a little bit of <clears throat> well, some things well, have. I have to come assure you that we've never talked about it being the town hall. So I know that's the okay. rumor, and that is not true. Okay, that's kind of absurd, actually. I don't think we've talked about it being. I don't think we've talked about it being anything. Anything else. at all. Um, okay. And the school, um, the superintendent made this option without talking to us at all, mm -hmm. and he didn't ask us the repercussion of it. Mm -hmm. but the first time we heard it was when you all heard it. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about it later this evening about the financial repercussions, um, but it's. But we really, we had no clue until you all got, got it. So, so you were blindsided too? Oh, definitely. We've been blindsided by many things mm -hmm. as of late. Um, but we did not know about it un, until the meeting was held. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to speak on uh, an initiative that's been brought to my attention through the state, which is an incentive program to turn vacant schools into low-income housing. Um, not, that, not that this would have been brought to your attention, um, but it is something that exists, and I think people should be aware um, that it could be a very real possibility. I just want to say one thing, and this is coming from me. Mm -hmm. No one else on this council. I was on the school committee when we proposed the schools, and so is Mike. Um, we proposed two options, uh, three neighborhood schools or one big school. Matter of fact, we went to other communities that had large elementary schools and actually looked at them. We proposed to the community what they would like. They picked the three. Mm -hmm. um, we ran campaigns. We did, uh, the community wanted three neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. 
I was on the council when we closed Nonquit, and so was Mike, and and we were sorry to do that, but at, at the time there was very little students going there, and we made that financial decision. The community picked three neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm, correct. Mike and I fought for that. We mm -hmm. were very much involved in that. Mm -hmm. We saw what the community wanted. Um, I, I went to meetings with senior centers. I went to all the PTO meetings. It was very clear to me it was three new schools. Mm -hmm. and, and we ran a referendum and we won it. And I still believe that this, this community wants three schools. And I, I will say this as long as I'm here, mm -hmm. that this is what yeah. happened when I was, and I was school committee chairman back then. Mm -hmm. I think Mike was my vice chairman. And it was very clear what the community want, and I don't think it's changed. Yeah, it has not changed. And I think the school committee needs to listen to this. Absolutely. And needs to remember back then. And, and understand the ramifications and some of the things that Shannon spoke about um, of we need to think about what, what would happen to a vacant, a vacant school building and where will the, um, the money go that we owe on the bond and that we'll talk exists. talk about that very soon. Right, and there, and there is some talk about using casino money on, on the other end to cover it, and that's not something that the town, uh, we've already decided where we want to spend our casino money and pouring it into a, a soon-to-be vacant school is not the answer. And we won't, we won't accept it. And I, I ex tried to explain the other night, but got interrupted several times. The casino money was a decision by this town council. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and we are paying for one-time expenses. Mm -hmm. And we are paying for capital expenses. If we didn't do this, this would be in the budget this year, all mm -hmm. these capital expenses, which would also raise your taxes, which would all also have to do with the percentage. Mm -hmm. You are saving money with what we're doing with the casino money. Oh, yeah, and you I'm not, and no, and I'm not and here to Anyone just... who thinks you're not... Yeah, it's absolutely. I'm wrong. not here to dispute that. So what I'm saying is, if if we close this school, um, and the what I've heard um, is the a, a potential um, a, the potential for using some of the casino monies to fund this existing bond um, to bridge that gap. Uh, which is something similar to what Lincoln uh, Casino in the town of Lincoln, what they did. Um, and I, I'm sure you guys can understand. Well, to speak for myself. Yep. Uh, when I, when this casino first came around, I supported it. And I supported it because I saw the potential for using it for the things that we're using it for, mm -hmm. um, not to bridge gaps. Um, and I will not go back on that. Mm -hmm. And if that means next election, if I run, I don't get in, that's okay. But mm -hmm. I think the best use of that money is for how we are using it now. Um, mm -hmm. So bridging a gap on a bond is not a good use of that money. And yeah, it's also, absolutely. And it's also... It's essentially not looking robbing to close Peter the school. to pay Paul. I'm not looking to close <laughs> the school, and I'm a proponent of affordable housing. That's not the way we need to do it here. Correct. I also want to say... I've heard this theory, and I think it's a little absurd, because if we take that money and take care of the deficit, we still have to find the money next exactly, year. Exactly, to pay, to pay and for, not only for the that, areas that it's not paying for. I, I don't yeah. know if you're all aware of the maintenance of effort. Yeah. So we would have to fund that next year, next plus year, one yeah. dollar. One plus one, yes. So we would just put us even deeper into debt. Correct. And keep in mind, the, the town council is very aware of this situation for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. and we've addressed it with the school committee. And I don't want you to think that we've ignored it. If you watch previous budget meetings for the last three years, we have not ignored it. Mm -hmm. But they continue to spend more than they receive. And that's something that the town council cannot control. Mm -hmm. Council Edwards? Yeah, um, I just want to add, and you know, again, I've, I've heard the rumors, I've seen the rumors posted on Facebook. Um, it is not incumbent upon a body that doesn't have taxation authority, like the school committee, to dictate to the municipal side how we will handle our assets. We own the schools. We, the town, own the schools. The schools use the, use the buildings, but we are the ones who foot the bill for the buildings. Um, and we are the ones who dictate 
how and when the casino dollars will be spent. So if somebody on the school committee or somebody else from the schools is pontificating or hypothesizing that, you know, we're going to use casino dollars to pay off a bond or, you know, we're going to do this, that, or the other thing, that's not their role. Their role is to manage the dollars that we give them to provide the best education possible for this town, and it is not their job. If they wanted to dictate how the casino dollars work, then they need to run for town council. They're on the wrong body. So it's going to become, I mean, we get to the other items, it'll become very clear where my okay. position is. But Great. yeah, they, okay. the, those are nothing more than rumors that have no bearing because okay. ultimately this body decides. Great, I'm glad we could clear that up. All right, thank you. I also want to say oh. I admire every single one of you for doing what you're doing and fighting for your kids. This is how I got into this, though, I want to warn you. Uh, <laughs> I became president of PTO and then school committee chairman, and now here I am. And this is how I got involved, because I fought for my kids years ago. But I admire you and keep up the good effort. Okay, thank you so much. Board of Licensing, Shannon Tuttle, Miriam Hospital Foundation, requesting special event permit for the Miriam Hospital Gala and auction, the Night of Champions, May 11th, 2024. 5.30 through 11 p.m. at Long Pucks, 300 Industrial Way. Um, before we start, um, Attorney Marcel, would you like to tell us what um, happened in court and your opinion on the gala and the court decision? Well, can we just hear, I'd like to hear from the uh, applicant as to what they're you intending to do. Let's do get that, that on the record. Okay, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, Shannon Tuttle, I work with Lifespan. Um, I work in their uh, special events office, in the development office, and we are planning to host the uh, Miriam Hospital Gala at Longplex on May 11th um, from 5.30 to 11 p.m. This, this coming May 11th. And what does this involve? So this is uh, an evening gala. We anticipate 500 approximately 500 guests. That's how many have attended the last several years. Um, the evening begins at 5.30 with arrival. Cocktail reception is until 6.45. Uh, and then we move into a program where guests sit for a seated dinner meal. Um, they are presented a program where the fundraising piece occurs. And then around 8.15, dinner is served. And then around 8.45, we announce the total raised for the evening. And then music begins, and we have dancing from 9 to 11. And this will be in the bottom, this would, bottom area? Yes, this will be on the first floor, uh, basketball court exclusively. So drinks will be served down there? Yes. Cocktails? Yes. Okay. Russell Moore and Catering. In the basketball court? Yes. Russell Moore and Catering is a licensed caterer, and they will be um, catering and serving the beverages. The catering would be off premises. The catering, they would be setting up a tent outdoors, a 30 by 40 tent, um, leaving space off the building, of course, for fire lane access. Um, and cooking the, the food underneath that tent. And then all plating will take place inside Longplex, again on the first floor, but in a space that's out of the way. Would, would there be any cooking done at the um, current restaurant that's on in the? No. Uh, none? no. Would you know if that will be open during this? Will I, the restaurant be open for pay other patrons? I believe the intention is for the Jim restaurant. Jim would have to answer that. The restaurant upstairs is open? Um, refresh my memory, someone. What is that parking there? Chris, do you remember? 280. So you have 500 people attending? So the guesstimate is that we would have approximately 200 cars. Um, guests typically show up in twos. Uh, we'll have a licensed valet company, Perfection Valet. They work with us most often for our other galas and the Miriam. Uh, they will park most of the vehicles. The first lot that you come upon when you drive to Longplex, that will act as self-parking. And then the next two lots will be accessible for valet only. 
to park. And then the last lot will be for our volunteers and our vendors who are arriving to park their vehicles. How about people that are upstairs? People who are coming to the, the restaurant upstairs? This is accounting for that as well, for extra parking. Um, where do you usually hold these galas? The last three years, the Miriam Hospital held their gala at the Waterfire Art Center in Providence. Yeah. Um, I don't believe the date was available this year. So we were looking to other venues in Rhode Island, and the theme this year is a Night of Champions. So it, it played into the theme pretty well to be in a sports complex. Mike? So is this under public comment, or is this under the actual license? That... This is under the actual license. So we're on the agenda item now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Board of Licensing 6A. Okay, I just want to I, make sure. I can't even see you. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, um, as, the, as the council knows, the board um, did, uh, excuse me, the, the, the court gave a ruling and upheld the decision of the zoning board uh, permitting uh, the events that were subject of the zoning appeal, which were, uh, I believe, a, a clothing, uh, cl retail clothing, a car show, um, I can't think of the other event um, that was upheld. The Expo. Expo, excuse me, the Sports Expo, Sneaker Expo. Um, this is, this event, um, while the, this event as just described to me or to us seems to be a, a, a little outside of the uh, of the decision of the court or the zoning board. The zoning board did not rule on uh, whether or not we could use this as a uh, facility for basically a gala, which is really turning it into a, like a restaurant type gala, in, in, uh, like, a, like a venue for like a wedding or something like that. So um, it's up to the council whether or not they believe um, this is appropriate under our entertainment license, um, I would suggest um, it's certainly within your discretion to either approve or deny it, but I don't believe the court's decision went as far as to now turn this into a banquet facility, which now it seems to be. Um, I have another concern. Uh, when we when we discussed liquor, we did not discuss liquor downstairs more than being served downstairs. Also, there's going to be a tent, and are you going to have people in the tent? No. no. Well, the, the catering team is... And where would the tent be? There were uh, two different options. Um, currently, I am running with the second option, which is the grass area on the side of the building. Um, when you come upon... Long so when you're facing it, yeah. it's on the right? Yep. yep. And that's where no parking is allowed normally. It's a, yeah, it's a yeah. field. Yeah, well, I see it right here, too. Um, I just don't think that this was, I've been very clear with this, um, that this is, this is even stretching it more than I even imagined it would be to have a gallery at Longplex. Um, anyone like to come in? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so while I understand that this does seem like it's a little far afield of uh, the purpose of the Longplex facility, I view this through the lens of a special event permit no different than when my neighbor across the street wants to have a wedding in their backyard. They come before this board, we give them you know, special one-off approval. In some cases, we have discussion about where the cars are going to be. Are they going to park on the street? Are they going to park on the grass? And um, so, you know, from that in that regard, I, you know, I personally don't see a problem with this as long as you know this doesn't become a you know ritualistic thing. Like we're not having galas every single you know weekend. Um, you know, it's it's like I said, it does it does seem like it's a little far afield. And then the other two. The other two points um, I did want to make, uh, well, actually, one is 
And when we think about longplex and, you know, what kind of goes on in there, um, you know, if we take a super strict definition of, you know, what we think recreation is, um, you know, does that mean that, you know, when I held my daughter's, you know, fifth birthday party there, I was kind of out of bounds because um, they do have rooms for that. They get the bounce house and everything. And which which we knew that that's what they were going to do. Yeah. So when I don't know. For for me, at least, um, you know, it's a one off thing. It's it's lifespan. They're an institution in the state of Rhode Island. Um, you know, every one of us has been to a lifespan hospital. I apologize. I know you work in Fall River um, <laughs> at a competitive, a competing hospital. Um, that has nothing to do with it, though. I promise. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I, I look at it from the perspective of it's a it's a good organization. They're raising some money. It's not like um, you know the long plexes in front of us saying, "Hey, we want to." turn this from basketball courts into a regular event type thing. And ultimately, if this does become, you know, a regular occurrence and every single weekend the Longplex is here, we have the right to deny those special event permits. So, um, you know, from my perspective, I, I think this would be fine. But if you're denying, if you're letting this go, what would you base your denial on next time you, because you let this happen? Well, I That's mean, it's my problem. Like, I, I, what's the I, get the, I get the precedent, but it's no different than us saying, you know, hey, you you can't turn your own home like I can't turn my backyard into a wedding venue, but I can have a one off wedding, you know, once every decade. Um, you know, that's just my thought. Mike. Uh, a couple things. One, a question for the solicitor first. Since Longplex already has, well, the sports kitchen, but, you know, in the complex there already has a liquor license. How does that fit into somebody else? Serving liquor on the premises. I think there's a separate caterer's license that, that's granted by the state. Okay. Um, and I appreciate what Councillor Edwards stated. However, I do think it's pushing the envelope. And I think one of the differences, if I am hosting a wedding at my home, I'm limited to being able to do that. What Mr. Long is doing is every time he wants to have some type of event, is having the vendor for that event come before us. Um, so the argument would be, well, I didn't ask for the event, the vendor did. I'm just least the rent, renting out my space. Um, I don't see this as recreation, and I appreciate everything Lifespan and Miriam does. Um, I don't see this as recreational, even close to being recreational. Um, and you know, from my uh, view of the court decision, I think we have every right not to approve this. Go ahead, Deb. Try and turn on. So, um, Mr. Marcello, can you just reiterate where, where the liquor license, because I remember granting a second license. It's in the restaurant and... Yeah, no, it's... We did can, talk about it being right, downstairs, though. Right, they can serve though. liquor upstairs. Can somebody refresh my memory? I, I believe that we granted a license to have liquor upstairs, but also to allow him to serve downstairs during their, during events. During All liquor, events. Though, I don't. I'm sorry. It's been a long week. All right, but well, not not to actually. There is some restriction, though, isn't there? I think there? it was like just beer and wine or something. It was there was a restriction. There was a restriction. I thought it was. But will there be alcohol served in the tent? Outside, no, the tent is just for the caterers. Right? Yeah, I think the that's people weird. will not be going out there to get their food. No, the, upon guest arrival, they're heading straight into the building. They're heading straight into the building upon arrival. Um, we check them in. Um, they've already given us their guest information. Um, most of our attendees are sponsors of the event, so it's a lot of um, well-known institutions in the state of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, that support the event and the hospital year-round. Um, so we've got their guest list ahead of time. They arrive, they register, they uh, check in, essentially. They um, head into the cocktail reception, they mingle. Again, this year the theme is sports-themed, so we're hoping to keep it fun, um, give them an opportunity for some games, some activity, mingle with people they haven't seen in a while and then head into the dinner reception so that way we can get to the fundraising portion. The goal of this event is to raise a million dollars that evening. Oh. We're six weeks away, um, so you can understand it's, my anxiety right it's, now. It's an auction, correct? We have, we have um, an auction, a live auction, a super silent auction that 
uh, occurs for about two and a half weeks prior to and then after. And we have a fund and need beneficiary. And this year, the fund and need beneficiary is to support mobile integrated health care. And that's where folks in the Miriam Hospital go out into the community and bring services to folks who can't come into the ER. And um, it kind of frees up space in the emergency room for folks who need that. Okay. So other than the restaurant, is there anything else open in that night? No. There'll be no kids' leagues. There'll be no, no people in the game room, no people walking on the track. It's just... The gym can be operating, yes. Well, I know, but I'm worried about parking. Parking, that's, that was my question, right. too. And, and Daniel Riley, Council for Longplex, the, we've already run the plan by the, uh, the event permits gone to the police and fire departments. There will be two detail officers present for the event, the police chief otherwise, I'm not going to speak for him, but based on my understanding, has no other objections of the event plan to include the parking, and that the expectation would be that the two detail officers, in addition to their other duties, would of course be enforcing all applicable parking regulations on the property and the adjacent public roads. I forgot my question. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Excuse me. Well, as my colleague uh, John Edwards V mentioned, unless this becomes a routine and ongoing system, and it is. Mr. Long has deviated from being a sports complex, and apparently he wants to become the Civic Center of Tiverton. This includes all kinds of events that really are not sports related in any way, regardless of how beneficial they are or how I approve of the applicants, which are not Mr. Long. He's had more than one special event permit. He's going to have more. He has what I consider to be an illegal parking lot, which he has developed to make it more accessible. I just don't see where this is going to end. Madam President. Um, Ms. Tuttle, when did you come to agreement with Mr. Long on using the property pending approval of an event permit? Uh, late, late fall, early late fall. winter of 2023. Okay. We've kind of essentially worked through, on, on my end, you know, working, uh, moving forward with vendors. We've been working, you know, with our committee yeah. and leadership. So in the I'm hospital. not going to fault you. I'm going to fault Mr. Long because he knows how significant these issues are for us. And you consistently come before us with only a few weeks in advance of the events from your potential um, <coughs> clients and putting us in a bad place. And I know you do that on purpose because you want the town to look bad. They should have been suggested to have a conversation with us last fall so we could have laid this out for them, what the potentials are. Because I don't want to see them lose the opportunity. But I will not approve anything going forward. I'm not sure on this one. But I will not approve anything going forward for your complex that you come to us in the 11th hour. Because that's not fair to them. I, I do, Madam President. The next application we have up involves Four Corners. Are the businesses at Four Corners zoned for antique shows, yes. cultural shows, art shows, and others? Yeah. Do they have the parking? I'm not going to address you from over there. You can come speak if you'd like. And we're not compare. Yeah, we're not going to compare the two. And, and they always give us a parking plan when they do these things. So. Jim, I'm not doing this with you tonight. I'm really not. No, you, I, you're out of order. Go ahead. What are you going to do? Thank you. Um, Same thing to judge. 
Go ahead. Question. For I'll you. have you walked out if you continue this. Go ahead. Question for you. Uh, you mentioned the theme, champions, right? We're looking for a sports related thing. Um, I'm assuming next year will be a different theme and you guys will be looking for a different venue? Yes. As um, it relates to the theme, is that correct? Well, um, not necessarily. Uh, you know, we're a Providence based hospital system, though we do offer services throughout the region. Um, a lot of our committee has shared concerns about, um, in a very Rhode Island fashion, the travel to Tiverton um, the night of. In fact, I just left my office with an email I need to respond tomorrow about um, shuttling some of our guests to Tiverton. So while the venue and the town is beautiful, I don't know that we're hurrying to have most of our constituents who live in the Providence um, South County area come back to Tiverton. And, and I would assume that, you know, things with 195 have probably changed the outlook slightly. And so I'm assuming yes. that if the bulk of your constituency is on the other side of the bridge, there's, there's probably less of an appetite to yes. do this again in this on this side of the bay. There's general concern. Okay. Thank you. I'm working through. Thank you. Anyone else? Any comments from town administrator or the lawyer? All right. Madam Chair? Yep. Uh, I'll make a motion that we approve the special event permit um, for Shannon Tuttle, Miriam Hospital Foundation, for the hospital gala and auction, Night of Champions, May 11th, 2024, from 5.30 to 11 p.m. at Longplex, subject to meeting all legal requirements. All right, that's the thing we want there, yep. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Yep. Do I have a second? I will second that. Motion been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? For, against? Um, four would be Councilor Paul, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Burke, and Councilor Janik. Against Councilor Demanderis and Councilor Edwards. Um, just to note, reiterate, my vote was in favor for your purposes because I don't want to see you lose the opportunity because somebody else wasn't transparent with you. So I appreciate your hard work and I wish you luck. Thanks very much. All right. Ted Bisco requesting special event permit for Tiverton Four Corners. Yeah. <laughs> Fourth of July Antique Show, July 4th, 2024, from 9 to 4 p.m. at the Meeting House, 28 East Road. Hi. How you doing? Just tell us a little bit about your event. So this event um, closed in 2019. It ran 20 plus years prior to that. Um, the show was passed down to me from the previous manager, Brian. Um, it hopefully will be, have 30 to 40 dealers um, show up. Um, we're working on that now. The logistics was still building up to it. Um, I put a very crude layout of the property. Uh, basically, they're 20 by 25 spaces. They're, they drive onto the property. They do their setup. Um, it, it's it's um, historically three to 400 people throughout the day funneled through. Um, busier in the morning. I'm going to ask for police detail if available. Yeah, so you're going to need one. Yeah. But where will parking be? Um, from the owner, she, she said there's abundant of property. Up, I know. But no, there isn't. So, um, how the, many people are you expecting? I know you just. I, I'm. <sighs> I'm guessing low numbers because it, it's, I'm guessing two to 300. Yeah, you're going to have to find alternative parking. Okay. Um, they've been using the lot yes, way have. down. Do you know what lot I mean? Yeah. It's a private owned lot. It's across from, somebody enlightened me, the store's there. Yeah. yeah. Across the street in the back? It's Jimmy Holland's lot. It's, um, what is the name of that shop? It's like cross where the knitting place used to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. Right. Yeah. 
She does not have enough parking for 200 people, I'll tell you that. Well, that's throughout the, the whole day. But you also have businesses that are... Correct. Yes, so... so um, Fourth of July. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, um, we... And I, I, I got to apologize because Brian never told me I had to come to the board. Oh, that's okay. He doesn't remember doing that prior to 2019, so... He probably um, did. Um, yeah, I we, just talked, we just talked yeah. about it last week, and he's like, I don't remember having to go, but anyway. I think um, we should put this on hold until you find out where you can park, um, until you talk to um, the owner of, the, of, of that land I'm talking about. Anyone if, uh, um, I'm sure that Roz knows who I'm talking about, okay. and she can get you in contact with that person. It is 4th of July. It's very, very busy down there. And you're gonna at least and if you do park in that area, we have told other people that are doing this mm -hmm. that um, two details will have to be necessary. So it would be to cross the people from, from the lot to across the street and then gotcha. across the other gotcha. way. Um, when we have an event like this it can get a little bit busy. Um, and especially since you're doing it on Fourth of July. Okay. Madam Chair, go ahead. Oh, a um, little tongue in cheek, but uh, perhaps um, given the number of events we've now referred to Jimmy Holland's lot, uh, we should be taking a commission. Maybe we could use that to shore up the Fort Barton school budget. Um, for what it's worth, I do want, I do remember this number. Oh, you do? Uh, no, no. So I do. I do remember this number um, from the first meeting I attended uh, on this council uh, the night we got sworn in. So it's 156 people is the max capacity at the meeting house, um, and just with that, uh, you're drawing it uh, where you're placing two of the porta potties. I think that would take up two or three parking spaces. So that number uh, would the be, porta potties are off to would the be side. lower. They're not, um, they're not on the uh, yeah. It's they're just, not they're, the parking. There's 35 are, parking yes, spaces correct. down yep. there, and I remember that because just we on had the to count. We spent yes. like 45 minutes on the whole yeah, subject. Yep. Went down there yeah, just on the grounds. Down yes. Down. Yep. Now the vendors will have their own parking, so that they're, they're not included. Where would in they that. park? They park on on the grounds. Next oh, their, of course. I'm sorry. Yes. Mike. Motion to table to our next meeting. Will I give Second. you enough time? Will I give you enough time? When's the next meeting? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Um, actually, is it two weeks? The first Monday in April. Yeah, it is. Second Monday. It's the second Monday, so it is in two weeks, because, yes, because April 1st is our yep. ride meeting. April. And Okay. So I'll, I'll, yeah, okay. and contact the police chief also, and they can help you with the, well with the details. All right. Thank you so much. He's actually out there somewhere. I think he's, he's in the lobby. The <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. All right, you, a motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. Still, Gilfillan Recreation, consideration of a sound variance for the 2024 Tivenin Summer Concert Series to be held July 12, 1926, August 2nd, 9, 1623, from 6 to 8.30, rain dates on August 30th and September 6th. This is already an event that we um, approved. All Stu needs is a sound variance. He called me this evening. He has, um, uh, he has other obligations and asked me um, if, if I would handle this for him. So is there any questions? I'd like to entertain a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd like to, I'm sorry, thank you. I'd like to open the public hearing. Anyone in the audience like to speak on this subject? Anyone in the audience? I'm gonna close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Madam Chair. Council Edwards. Uh, motion to approve the sound variance for the 2024 Tiverton Summer Concert Series, July 12, 1926, August 2, 9, 1623, from 6 to approximately 8.30 p.m., with rain dates on August 30th and September 6th. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Excuse me. Approved, unanimous. General business, uh, Council President DeMadiris, discussion regarding potential financial impact on bond indebtedness of closure for Barton Elementary. Um, we're gonna ask the attorney to, dis to um, start. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so at the request of the council, um, 
I was asked to look at the uh, bond documents related to the uh, schools that were the subject of an early discussion tonight. Um, as the council may know, um, there was a refinancing of all of approximately $30 million of school bonds uh, that happened. Check date. What? Twenty seventeen. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and the original bonds were approved back on um, August seventh, two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. So there was a refinancing. For, I, I assume for financial reasons, for better interest rates. It was. And there was a. Um, and there, and that refinancing was an amalgamation of bonds, other bonds across the state of other school districts. So we are a very small part of a larger bond issue. So. Um, I preface my remarks saying that I am not bond counsel. It's a very special, specialized area of the law, but I did receive the bond document. And um, if the school is closed, that does not uh, make the bond callable. In other words, it doesn't automatically, the remaining balance don't, does not automatically become due uh, if the school is closed. However, the town is still on the obligation to pay the remaining principal and interest on their remaining bonds. <laughs> And in discussions with the town administrator, who he has had with Ride, what would be put in jeopardy is the potential um, housing aid reimbursement. We get, I think, a 35% reimbursement from the bonds uh, from the from the department of, uh, for housing aid from the state. We pay the principal and the interest, and then the state gives us the 35% back. And um, based upon this bond document and my discussions with the town administrator, and he can, uh, who spoke to Ride, the town would lose that ability to get the 35% back for the remaining of the bond. So the town would have to make up that difference on our side to pay the bond uh, principal and interest. Which is a, approximately $1 million, correct? I don't know the exact amount. I think that. Chris? Yeah, we owe currently about $3 million. 35% would be just over a million. So what my understanding this afternoon is what um, Attorney Marcello is referring to is state law, correct? Um, Chris? So the state law says if it's no longer used as an educational facility. They, they wouldn't pay housing uh, reimbursement. The minute, you lose the housing the, reimbursement. The minute that goes away. So. Which would come up to about a million dollars that we would be. Over three years, over the, uh, between now and 2028. Any questions from the council? Madam Chair? Yeah. Uh, just a comment. Um, obviously, this is untenable. A uh, million dollars over the next four years is crippling to the municipal side. So the fact that the school committee is contemplating this move, I just, I don't know where they come off on this. Now, it is my understanding uh, that while the school committee has positioned this as um, sort of a last ditch effort and something that they don't wanna do, but they have to do, uh, I believe this has been kind of their plan all along. Um, it's my understanding that the school committee went to ride to find out all of this information last budget cycle, um, which gives me Graves pause because ultimately, you know, this, this would cripple the municipal side. I mean, that 250 to $300,000, you're talking about the inability for us to, you know, negotiate things like uh, the DPW or the police contract, which we're in talks with now. We've got fire contracts coming up. Um, I, I just, I can't believe that the schools would attempt to put us in this position when they themselves have no taxing authority. There is, they, there's no one for them to answer to. Ultimately, this is just a way for them to shift the problem onto our balance sheet and then it becomes our problem and then we have to deal with the ire from the, our constituents. And to me, that's, that's, just, that's just wrong. It's bad politics and it's just wrong. Well, either way, it becomes this, the taxpayer's problem. <laughs> because no matter, that's what this all is. This is, a, both budgets affects the taxpayers. So shifting it from one side to the other does not accomplish anything for the taxpayers. And that's my problem with this. Um, anyone else? Deb? Just the schools committee did present to the budget committee earlier, or late last week, 
um, and did make it quite clear that it was solely in the school committee's um, venue to say they would close the school. We have no say in that. We say as a town council what the budget is approved for, but we can't say what they do with that money. Um, we only vote for the bottom line. Um, and so they said that it is entirely up to them what they will do with that school. So I applaud all of you who are working hard and trying to get some of the facts out and um, digging into the deeper facts to find out what exactly is going on. Um, the, this town just can't afford five million dollars. Um, we have, like John said, we have things on the other, on the municipal side that we just can't afford. And if we were even to bail that out with any kind of money, there is the, the MOE, which means that whatever we give the schools this year, we are mandated by state law to give them next year plus a dollar. So we just, we just can't do that. There is not money possible to do that. So um, thank you for all your work, and we'll work here trying to work on our the budget best as we can, but um, it's, it's kind of a no-win situation for us. Yeah, one second. I'm going to see if um, I'm going to let the council speak. Jay, do you have anything to say? I have a lot to say, but I'm not going to say it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and to my mind, this begins and ends with the school superintendent. To me, this is just a tactic for him to get his way. And the school committee seems to be drinking the Kool-Aid. And I've been doing this for, this is my eighth year. Four years on the council, four years on the budget committee. And every year I've gone through this particular scenario, not with closing the school, but overspending their budget. They always have excuses, they always have reasons. Even if we had given them 4% a year for the past eight years, we would still be in this pickle. And the reason is that if the current state budget holds, that would mean that in the past two years, we will have lost $2 million in state aid. We can't make that up. We haven't got the money. Where are we going to get it? We have mandated maximum increases in the budget, 4%. Does anybody want us to petition the state to go to 6% or 8%? I don't want to do it, and I won't. Well, there's certain guidelines that limit us to do it. it, it there's certain reasons why. Oh, I, we I should do it. I think, but, I think Councillor Edwards is, asked, is mentioning petitioning so. to raise the cap at the right. state level. Well, yeah, I know. No, not for us. Oh, I mean, for across the board. Yeah. Across the board cap. So, I think what has to happen here is we give the school what we can, and we require them to work within that framework. And if that means that they have to pair their their staff or tone down the raises. I don't care what they have to do, but they have to do it, just like we do. Chris. Now, if they think we're going to lay off firemen and policemen and DPW workers and, and all the rest to accommodate them, they got another thought coming. Chris. So um, last week, or a week and a half ago, I don't know how long ago it was when the school, I guess it was the 12th when they had their first meeting. I was completely disappointed in our elected officials on the school side and our administration of the school. And that offering as an option to close a, a very vibrant school system that many voters had voted to put in place, that they wanted their small schools in their districts. Believe me, I was one of the few people um, when these bonds came about originally, I wanted one school. And from the day it was approved, I have done nothing but support the schools, that that was their decision, and we should honor that decision. 
and I quite frankly think that we should continue to do that. I also think, and what I asked that night, was for the school committee to have a full-throated public hearing, not some buried line item that they were willing to vote on that night, but a surprise to everybody that we're going to close a school. To me, it was just egregious conduct. It's, um, it's malfeasance at best, nonfeasance at worst. Um, th this is just wrong. All they're going to do, th there's really going to be no savings in closing that school because within the last year, Dr. Sancioni was before the Town Planning Commission and explained to the Planning Commission that there were probably 20 to 25 seats available in each of the three elementary schools. So where are we going to be in a couple of years when these developments get developed and the Bourne Mill is done and we have all these new students? We're going to be asking to build another building? This is just ludicrous. It is, it's, it's, there's no foresight into what needs to happen. The taxpayers in this town have been are faithfully paying these bonds, supporting the school system with these nice uh, school buildings, only to have your school administration and your school elected officials just toss it away like trash. I, I am so disappointed in what's going on here. And all it's going to do is put the burden on the town side of the budget, which is, it is what it is. I mean, we'll deal with it like we have dealt with every other fiscal issue that we've dealt with. It doesn't make it right. And it's not fair to the elderly people in this town who pay taxes. I mean, I get this whole thing with schools. I t totally agree that you are doing everything you can to, you know, to uh, embrace education for your children, and you should as parents. But there's a whole other dynamic that in town financing that we look at. And the people in this town voted to support these bonds. So to throw it away like trash is just, to me, reprehensible. There's got to be another way. And the two options that they gave you, when I've seen some of the work that you people have done going through those budget items, my real issue is there's not a budget deficit. There never has been a budget deficit. They have a legally conforming budget that riders adopted. If there was something wrong, they should have done a corrective action plan within I think it's five days to the town council, or 15 days, and 30 days to the state. That's never happened. They just have a, 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 a will to continue spending money that was one time. When the town has one-time monies, it goes into the general fund reserves, and we use it the best that we can to ho help offset taxes because it, the taxes reach everybody's, not just education or, or parents, but also elderly and people on fixed incomes. So this is a very difficult situation to deal with, and I'm going to be honest with you. If you have questions, you can more than welcome call me. I'll tell you how this system works. I was the budget, on the budget committee for 19 years. Um, I went away for this town for a little bit. The council asked me to come back to be their administrator for a while. I'm very well versed in how this all works. It's going to be a daunting task to put this back together the way it should be. But your school committee needs to have a full-throated hearing on whether or not they should close these schools because the entire town voted on it. And they should be supporting that, especially when they have so few seats left that where we're going to be in a year from now. It's just ludicrous. Anyone else? Yeah, Madam President, I, I just uh, I remember that's out there so we can address it now. If they were to close that school relating to this 35%, if they move the administrative offices there, does that affect the 35%? Why would they? It, uh, it's just a rumor that's asking to be addressed. I can't answer that question right now, but I, I'd look yeah, into it. That's, yeah, I'm not sure what that answer would be. Um, Madam Chair, if I could clarify for Councillor Paul, or for yeah. the attorney. In order to get the housing aid, do there need to be students in the building? I think so. I think so. I think it has to be used for educational purposes. Purposes or, or I students? I like when you look quote man, it's probably it's for educational purposes. So you could yeah. make it. Argue. I think that will we'll give you a break and we'll have you check next I, I don't want to give advice that I'm not sure of. I'm not an educational, uh, but I think I think you have to, what the, how you define I educational haven't. purposes is, is could be very broad or could be I, very narrow. I think I we know. should ask right on April 1st. Yeah, yeah April 1st, good. we're going to get some answers. I do want to make it clear that this council has, um, we gave 3% and we gave 4%. Um, a lot of the members on this council actually worked for budgets that gave um, the schools 
4% and the 5.2, the Sanford Mandel. Um, that was worked from my house with volunteers, with Trish Hilton that used to be president of the town council. We worked in collaboration with Diane, Fons Diane Fonsworth and Deb, um, and we worked together. And, and then when we fought for the budget um, option two the year before, that was done with the majority of this town council also. And I was a member of the school committee for eight years. Mike was for six. We have members here that were on the budget committee. Most of the members here were on, all of the members here were on the budget committee, besides me and Mike. Um, so this is a well-educated town council. We know how it works. Um, we have accepted for the town less than what we've given the schools. We've done everything we could to help them. But when you are given a 4% increase and you spend 8%, shame on you. When you ask for four and you get three, then you should look at your budget and cut it by that 1%. Not spend one-time money and then ask us for it later. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem because the town needs things now. And we've been putting things off. And I don't think it's fair for our town employees, for our fire, police, DPW, to once again say, oops, the school committee did this, so we're not going to give you what you deserve. And I just don't think it's fair. I just don't think that it's fair when you give 4% and you spend 8%. Shame on you. And the taxpayers should be angry. Are we done? Madam Chair, so, Would more. someone like to, the audience would like to? Yeah, go, go ahead, I, I was just going to put a quick bow on this by saying that, you know, just to reiterate the point that while they're talking about closing a school, it's ultimately not going to save anyone who pays taxes in this town any dollars because it just shifts the burden from the school side and onto the municipal side. And again, it's them hiding and not wanting to take, or not wanting to be the adults in the room and make adult decisions. Hi, my name is Lori Reese Brooks. I live on Bogomash Road. I grew up here and I moved back here with my daughter after homeschooling her. She's now in the sixth grade. Um, when these options came out and I heard about the bonds, I anticipated that this is what was going to be of it. And option one is getting rid of a lot of the teachers. So, you know, when I listen to you all, I, I'm in agreement with what you're saying and the one-time money has brought in paper. Um, there's also a Lexia program. There's a lot of technology, 400% increase in the electronic textbooks. I don't want my daughter to be taught by that and by the computer. And I'm just concerned that something has to be done because they have overspent and is option one, getting rid of all of our specialists, the guidance counselors that our children so desperately need, especially emotionally what has happened. We're real, in real jeopardy of losing that, aren't we? This is something that you need to discuss with the school committee. Yes. Like, like we've said a hundred times, we give them a number. Mm -hmm. They choose what to do with it. We have no say in anything they do with it at all. And I just so wanna, you need to bring that up to the yeah, school. I agree there, with I'll you. I'll be there tomorrow. But you need to bring that up. <laughs> Everyone needs to know. We give that one number, and we, we have faith that's what will be spent, and it'll be for the best. But we have no say in it. I do want to clarify, too, because I, I thought I heard Mr. Edwards and then uh, Ms. Janik say about who has say to close the school. It's them. So they can close the school. Absolutely and we can't do anything about it. Even though there is a bonds yep. in it? Yep, yep. Okay, thank you so Unfortunately, much. Unfortunately, but yes. And, oh, I'm sorry, that's all been in my head. I, I didn't even plan to speak and I- Oh no, it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. Um, I just kind of lost, oh, does this budget have to be in and approved in June? So I'll, this all, like the audit that's getting done, like that's probably not going to get done and they have to approve this, which means a decision's going to have to be made with option one or option two in June. Okay. Not, it depends on what they decide. Um, what was I going to say? I am going to 
we, we have two scheduled budget um, meetings. We go through our line by line items with all our employees. I have decided those two will be just used for town. And I haven't even told him we're going to need a third. There's definitely a third. And, we're go and I talked to the town administrator. I think we should have the third meeting just for the schools. And maybe by then, because the auditor is working on specific things, okay. maybe by then we might have some answers. Okay. Um, we have to, the town council, and I think this is on the town website, but if not, it's a timeline. Um, the town council has to adopt a preliminary budget by May 13th. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, just for the public, if you go to the town's website, go to boards and commissions, and then go to budget committee, it is the one item that says budget process key dates. Okay. Like okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Jen. Everybody. Hello. I have address. Oh, Not everybody sorry. knows. Jen you. Jocelyn, <laughs> 123 Russell Drive. Okay. My question is specifically about state aid. So, to my understanding, part of our state aid is being lost for two reasons. One is, re well, my understanding is two, John, so you can enlighten yeah, me. Well, yeah. So, one is loss of students, so that I understand. One is higher home values, and then the state saying that we have a higher affordability um, to give to our schools. If that is the case, not talking about the whole budget as a whole, not talking about the entire ask for the school committee, is there any conversation amongst yourself about helping with that portion of state aid that's being removed due to higher home values? And before you answer, I do just want to say one thing to Mr. Cotta. So one of the things that I hated when I was on budget, company, on budget committee is when we pinned demographics against each other. When we talk about seniors and we talk about families, affordability is affordability. It doesn't matter what age you're in. There are some homes that have multiple incomes just to make their taxes versus being an elderly person as well. So we are all stuck in this awful boat, us parents and citizens. So I would rather not have that conversation about who is going to be impacted more by raising tax levels. We're all in the same boat. So there's people that are working that can't afford their taxes, and there's people that are elderly that can. It's not fair to pin one demographic or the other, because then that becomes the conversation. And that was so much of a conversation when I sat on budget committee. That, that's true. But when you look at trying to reward somebody for overspending yeah, by $5 million, it does have a lot of impact. It's, it's totally unfair, totally, for all of you and the other demographic. And, and that was the only point I was trying to make. So you, you're absolutely right. It is, it's difficult to do that. But you know, this is not a one time or an anomaly. This has been going on for quite a, quite a while. I'm well and aware, and that's it, why I'm not looking for not, the whole it's answer. It's not an easy fix. Just the state aid question. Right. So as far as the, um, uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. Chris, I, go ahead, explain it. As far as the question on the state aid was, um, how, so there were actually, the way, because I talked to the Department of Revenue as soon as that 1.2 million came out, and they gave the assessor and I about an hour and a half conversation to break it down. There was the um, loss of 60-some students. Mm -hmm. There's a formula for that, um, which I also want to find out that, the, quite frankly, the town could, in its infinite wisdom, decide to seek a waiver to reduce the MOE by the town share of that, which we should all know what that is. There's the um, high, um, no, it's not school lunch. It's the, um, the, poverty, the poverty level. level. I don't know how we lost 9% of our kids, but we did. But th to me, it's just astounding that we, I don't know where they went. But, and then there was another factor, it was $681,000, and they're, they're trying to attribute that that was all related to town evaluation. That's not true. Within that $681,000, there was a, in the FY24 budget, there was COVID monies that the governor and Department of Ed gave this town 400 and I believe it was $30,000 of that 680. That was one time. And it was known to be one time when it was given. So that 600 is, so that you take the 680, take out the four change, you're left with about 200 to $300,000 that's attributed to valuation. So that there are really four components to the loss of state aid. And Ride will explain that when we have them before us on April 1st. Um, we, we got a full-throated 
uh, discussion with DOR because we were astounded by the number. And we had an $800,000 cut a couple of years ago. We couldn't understand why we, we kept getting these cuts. So um, it is what it is, but at the end of the day, we need to know all the factors that go into this, and we will definitely get that and present it to you as we, as we, as we get it. Is there any conversation with other municipalities about certain laws and restrictions that we have to follow, that we have to fund, such as busing to St. Phil's and to All Saints that's required by state law, um, and other things like that that have kind of moved so outside. The, I mean, I understand so, when so the law came out. So there are a number of out. unfunded mandates that come down from the state that we're obligated to do, and we just have to, whether it's textbooks for kids outside the district or those kind of right. things. Right, but has there been any conversation or opportunity for us to work with other municipalities that say, basically, can this be, you know, when it was started in whatever 19, whatever a year, um, the things and prices of things have changed enough that and the tuitions that these schools are currently charging mandate them to provide their own transportation because we can no longer, like it's a teacher. It's a teacher's, if not more, it may be two. I don't know the exact cost of that one single bus. I don't, I don't disagree, but that's a question for the school committee. Okay. That's what they're charged with dealing with, that's the school administration. Those are the things that are outside what we do, is, that I do. Is yeah, running. I was just asking about collaboration but, but, with other towns. But there, if it's state law, we're bound by, we're, we're obligated to follow. We can't, we can't. Oh, no, I'm not yeah, saying I'm not follow it. I'm saying is there any all right. mechanism to change I, it? I don't think you can do that. But it's, we're going a little off topic. I, I was just, no, 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 it's all right. I was just reminded by my lawyer. Um, I, but we're not way off topic if I bring up B. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring up B right now and then let people talk, because we were talking about the... Budgets. And, yeah, Nancy, I see you. I, I, I just want to bring up B so that we're back on topic. Are you going to talk about... What are you going to talk about? Are you talking about the bond? About what we're talking about with the schools? All right, go ahead. And I just have one question that is new to me since I was either on the Budget Committee or the Town Council. The charter has changed, and I gather it, by ordinance, it now there's a unified budget that's put forward. Right. Where in my day, you know, four years the, ago, the school committee put it their, like so far the, away. The school committee put their budget in the blah blah blah. So, what has been the effect of this unified budget in terms of the town council putting forth the unified budget? Are we now? having to adopt this somehow, come to some kind of agreement with the school committee? How does this work? I don't understand. Well, last year it worked out very well. That was our first one. What happens is, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, if any, anybody wants to inter interrupt me, the school committee prepares a budget and the town prepares a budget. It's submitted to the town administrator. Meanwhile, the budget committee does their regular right, process. Right, right. The budget committee gives a budget also, a recommendation. Right. The town council looks at all of this, it's brought to the town council, and we do the unified budget. There is an opportunity for an alternate budget, no, just I like there was that, before. But in doing the unified budget, does the town council have the ultimate ability to actually shape the budget the school committee gets? We can, we, we can give them the same as before, we give them a bottom line number. Okay. Now, in coming to that bottom line number, we're going to have our ideas of where that might come from. Right. But we can't tell them to take it from here and take no. it from there. No, I understand So it'll that. still be, if could, they give us X, right. we might say, well, you're going to get X minus Y. Okay. And that goes into the yeah, unified right. budget. Awesome. Yeah. And then the other question I had, I just wasn't sure. I thought you said that you were sort of blindsided by you, Denise, earlier tonight. Yeah. About awesome. what, the school, what happened with the, the school budget. But you also said you sort of been on it for two years. And no, I was confused. I was blindsided by the closing of Fort Bonden. Oh, okay. We found out the proposed. Yeah. We all were blind. We found out the morning of. And we found out from the schools, people we know that work there, who called and said, Do you know this is going on? Because the superintendent was meeting with teachers regarding yeah. this. Okay. And so we had no preparation for that whatsoever. As far as them being in debt, every year they come to us and tell us that. 
And we've asked them to correct it. We've given them what we thought yeah. would help fix it. Yeah. I wasn't blindsided that they were okay. doing Thank what you. they're doing now. Okay. All right. Thanks, Nancy. So the next thing is Council President Di Madeiras discussing an impossible vote of the town council to re request school department provide a detailed summary inclusive of the budget actuals for fiscal year 23-24 and fiscal year 24-25. I am requesting, that, well, as of today was the first time we've seen any documents from them. And, and this is what they gave us, and this is what they gave us last year. So I'm really confused. Even this didn't have actuals, though. What I am saying is, and I don't know if you watch town council meetings, but every other month, the treasurer gives us a report, tells us exactly what was spent in those two months, what is left over, and then the town administrator gives us suggestions on any accounts that look like they're going to be shortened and any accounts that look like they have overage. We do that every other month. We have never seen that from the school committee. And I think in order for us to make the right decision now, because that's how our budget process goes, if you've ever watched it, we look, what did you actually spend this year? Can we save that line? Or, ooh, you went a little over, let's put more money in there. I've never seen that from that side. What I want to know is for the last two years, what they spent, what was left over, and we know there was money left over, because they have over $1.4 million in reserve right now. So I, I need to know what they actually spent and what is left over and what they took the 3% and spent it on. Um, we cannot, and we've said this a hundred times tonight, we cannot tell them what to spend it on, but we certainly can say, well, after looking at this, we don't see why you need 4%. Or, and that's what... I think it's only fair to all of us, even everyone in this room, that we actually see those numbers. I understand that some parents have been asking for actualities and not getting anywhere. So this is a request from us because I cannot give them any money until I see what they're spending and what they're doing over there. Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was waiting on this because I wanted for this item, not the bond indebtedness. Um, a couple things. I would suggest that we look back further, um, back to before COVID. So at least the FY19-20 and all the budgets from that forward. Um, I would also like to see every dollar spent from pandemic funds, so ESSER 1, 2, 3, and any other one-time funding sources. Um, so for example, we're going to forget your name, Amber. Um, Laurie, um, I think you mentioned Lexia was something that uh, may have been used one-time money. I also, and I don't know if this is the same tutoring program, but there's a tutoring program paper. that, paper. yeah, paper that I know was spent with one-time money. I want to see if that's still in the budget. Yeah, that's okay. Majority aren't using it. I heard seven, 100 out of 800 using it. Um, so then, having sat on the school committee, would I be saying, okay, if we have one more year left for that, that's one-time money. So where are you going to take it from within the budget? Not add to, where are you going to take it from within the budget? Because it's very clear that all those ESSER funds were one-time funds. And we have the same thing. We still have some one-time funds that we've been, now, the schools had different guidelines and different timelines, so I know they had to come up with plans. Municipalities had a little bit more flexibility in terms of timelines and the like, but we're being very diligent in how we're going to use those funds and making sure that they're one-time uses that will help improve um, our capital, our buildings, our facilities, our equipment, um, those types of things. Not going to go to ongoing operational expenses. So I would suggest that we ask specifically about those. Um, you talked about the forensic audit. And lastly, you know, I think it's very important, and, and the council president alluded to this, um, schools cannot exist in a vacuum. You need good roads, DPW, get the buses to and from. You need police, 
to be able to help manage anything that might come up and to make sure that those people aren't driving by the bus that aren't supposed to be driving by the bus when the bus pulls over to pick up the kids. You need the fire to take care of all those safety aspects and all the other components of a town that go into it. Because I've heard arguments, well, education is the only thing that we are required to fund. I don't think most people in the town will see it that way. If we stop paying for roads, and I know there are roads with potholes on them, I'm not saying there aren't, um, but if we stop fixing roads, then you don't have a town that people want to live in either. So I think that's important. And, and we've set aside, and you know, I, w I would urge you, if you have time, to come to some of our other um, meetings and the budget committee meetings when they're talking about police, fire, DPW. And, and the chiefs can tell you, and Rick can tell you, what their needs are and how they've been, in some ways, managing by a shoestring. Um, you know, the turnover rates in the police and fire department, partly because of salaries. Um, so, and that has a long-term effect on us because if we train you to be a firefighter or a police officer and three years later you go somewhere else, then we're just throwing money away. And we need to stop throwing money away. So we need to be smart about this going forward. And, and again, I'll just reiterate, casino money is one-time funding. It's for one-time improvement projects for the good of the town as a whole. And we have given at least a million, I think I lost count, um, two, three million to the schools so far out of casino money, out of three years' worth of funding. So out of a total of $9 million available to us? Six. Six million dollars. We've yes. committed six yeah, point. Yeah. We've committed six point two over the next three years. Twenty twenty one. Governor Romano took it away. Yeah, oh, right. six million dollars. Okay, thank you. Which, which which goes right to the point of one time monies. Because exactly. when when they brought me in to be town administrator, I came in on April first, twenty twenty, and the governor had declared the state of you know the, 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 we were going through the emergency, and there was a caveat in the state law that said if there was um, an emergency that they could renege on the gaming monies and governor Armando did take it away it was embedded in every one of our budgets every one of them that's the way it was and we had to unwind that to ensure that that would never happen again um and in the council's infinite wisdom they've done a very good job of ensuring that the money a has to be in hand before they spend it and it will be for one time capital needs so it's really indirect tax relief it's, you know, we're not putting it in the budget and we're not taxing it. We're not generating as revenue, but we're also not um, asking you to pay it in your budgets. So that's one of the reasons why it's important not to spend one-time monies as your, opera uh, as your operations. And I just want to, um, Chris just reminded me of something. When we gave them this money, it was to do specific projects. If it was safety-related, we got a reimbursement. Um, at like 40% on some of it. Yeah, we get what this council did, and we usually would have taken that and put it right in the general fund, what this council did was put, to set up a special account for the schools. All that reimbursement goes into a special account for capital. So if they want, but they still have to come to us, but instead of going into the general fund, it's going into a school committee fund. A, a school department fund now. So they have additional money that they can use for capital, which has helped the taxpayers tremendously because we are not taxing for that. So in, in addition to the funding formula, there is a, another state law that requires per every square foot of school um, infrastructure, there's a dollar amount that you have to spend in maintenance. And because budgets get thin and you know, they have other purposes. This was a very good way of ensuring that the town meets its maintenance obligations to comply with the law without overburdening you with the tax taxes. So, uh, but, uh, Deb, John's had his hands out for a minute. Than yes, longer than you. <laughs> he kind of wanted to speak before Mike, but Mike asked me. Go ahead, John. <laughs> That's what, you know, being the council president's, the council president's, well, in this case, left-hand man, I guess. Um, I will be very brief. 
So uh, first off, if anybody wants to see exactly what we're referencing, it is on the stage. Uh, feel free to pick up a copy. Um, it's also on the website. It's also on the website. It is, uh, again, I, I, I'm a math guy. Um, I'm having trouble making the math math, uh, and partly it's because we can't see the underlying expenditures in each one of these accounts. Uh, as Madam Chair referenced, we have give, been given backup in the past. What I would like to see us get our hands on is something that we could walk through in essence again this is a uh, this would be not required for the school committee but at least for my own edification I'm a trust but verify guy um, I would like to start from zero dollars uh, at the schools and I would like to build my way back into what the budget should be so that we can avoid things like hiding for instance one-time programs that should have that were funded by one-time dollars that should be no longer in the budget so um, I'd love to get my hands uh, on that specific backup. And in addition, echo uh, the request uh, by Councillor Burke for um, all of the... Uh, 2019 through 2025. I, yeah, as, long, as far back as they can go, but most importantly, so when I was on the budget committee, uh, I asked the school committee for budget to actuals, um, uh, trailing five year and then year to date. And I was given two sp separate spreadsheets and I noticed something very quickly, that the budget numbers for half of the accounts didn't match between the two different spreadsheets. And part of the issue there, I was told, is that those numbers are just arbitrarily adjusted. So. If we're going to see what the budget dollars are, I'd like to know what they were when they put the, the budget was voted on by the school committee, not what they were changed to throughout the year. Uh, because we, we don't have enough information to know what's actually in this budget, and until we get it, we're flying about as blind as everybody else here. And you know, just to dovetail in with what we talked about on the, the prior item on the bond indebtedness piece, if you know, the schools are going to close a, a building and, you know, they're going to burden the municipal side with, you know, an additional $250,000 that we don't have. Um, that means there's less money for us to give to the schools. I mean, they've asked us for 4%. They've shown us that they want like 9 almost 10%. Um, and if they're going to destroy the municipal side of the budget, they're going to get like a dollar. Um, and that's just the hard facts because we can only raise so much. 4% of our existing budget would be two, a little over $2.3 million. That would take us to a total spend between municipal and school side of six, just over $60 million. So we're hamstrung by the state. We're not bankrupt. We're not going to be able to break the cap, meet those criteria. So the schools need to be forthcoming, and they need to give us the information. And one final point, I think this is the one that should drive it home for everybody. What was the school committee doing over the last, what, five years? Their job is to be the fiduciaries of your tax dollars that we send over there. They have completely and totally failed. And unless we get some real answers, they are the ones who need to answer for this. Right? I don't blame the superintendent for wanting more money for schools. I blame the school committee for being the check and balance on, on the superintendent and not doing their job. All right. Deb. So the year that Mr. Carter talked about when he first came on, Councillor Edwards and I were on the budget committee and we spent many hours um, cutting back because we really didn't know what we were getting. We were really flying without radar. So um, that was very challenging. Um, but I'm hearing a lot of people saying that the schools are mismanaging money. They got all these millions, but you need to understand that we are mandated to do repairs and upgrades on our schools. And there is a building committee, Councilor Burke and I are on that, and we look at all of the schools and what the needs are, and by ride regulations, we had developed a five-year plan. We categorized and prioritized all of the different items that needed to be done amongst all of the schools. And we sent those toward the, to the council and then to ride. So in order to be reimbursed, the first step is the council has to sign off on it by Rhode Island regulation, and then it goes to ride and ride has to approve it. We then get reimbursed. So the, the percentage we're reimbursed varies depending on which category those repairs, renovations, upgrades fall in. 
the highest reimbursement is for health and safety. So we did do a lot of the safety, a lot of safety um, upgrades happened here at the high school, some at the elementary and middle schools, and those are going on into this, this fiscal year. They were in the last one and they're going into this one. The big project in the gym doing the, um, the locker rooms that are the original locker rooms in this high school from the 1960s. The only thing that changed in those locker rooms since the 60s is the paint. That's, that's what's holding those locker rooms together. So we did, we did approve that. That goes under um, health and safety. And so we get a 45% reimbursement. Um, that goes into that specific capital fund for the schools. We have one for the municipal side, for grants we've gotten from USDA for vehicles, and that will help fund the municipal side one-time items, capital, and it's specific in its language. That is what it's for. We were able to approve the money for those locker rooms this year because we had $800,000 in that capital fund that's specific for that, that project, for, for the capital projects for the schools. So it's not that the schools were dumped on, you know, $3 million and they squandered it. That $3 million was for one-time capital items, repairs, upgrades, um, siding, windows, bathrooms in the high school, the middle school, some repairs in some of the elementary schools. There's a whole big long laundry list. You can get that from the schools. Um, the superintendent can provide that for you. We have it. We, we have it, yeah, we have it. So um, I just don't want people to think, well, the schools had all of this money. What did they do with that? And money is earmarked from where it comes from as to what we can do with it. And we, it's not just like a big open checkbook and we can just write checks here, there, and everywhere. If we get grants, they are usually specific for a certain service, a certain operation, a certain piece of equipment, a capital item, and we can't use it for anything else. So I just wanted people to understand that it's not as easy as just write the, open the checkbook and just, <laughs> and just write it. And, you know, council, just, just give them more. Like, there's just a lot of ramifications for every choice that's made. And um, it's not easy. So I'm not looking forward to this, this budget right. season. So, David, um, it's already almost 9 o'clock. I can't believe it. But, David. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Madam President, three quick points. Um, one, as far as transparency goes, um, every month the town council gets a packet from our treasurer. It's the town municipal side's budget right down to the penny on a monthly basis. If that's not more transparent than anything, I don't know what is. Um, the other point I had is, as far as pain goes, at the end of the day, however the dust settles here, there's likely going to be educators that are going to lose their jobs. And I don't think there's a person in this room that feels comfortable with that. Um, I, I know some of the other council members have lost sleep over the last week with all of this going on. And the reality here is we shouldn't be the ones losing sleep. It should be the school committee. Um, they have a job to do, and they, they failed at it miserably. Um, at, at this point, as some of you have heard this quote before, and I'll say it again, at the rate things are going, the school system is becoming a country club, and the municipal side of this town has been neglected far too long. We're becoming a third world country. We, we got to balance the budget out. The municipal side has needs. And again, I'm pro-education. There's probably not a person up here that's not. So um, there's, there's got to be a balance somewhere, but the answer is lay with them. So. Just one last piece. Um, I, I am not going to sit up here and vilify the school committee. Um, I think they have a hard job to do. Um, I think they were presented a budget. It's still early in the budget process. They still have the ability and willingness, I believe, to go back and look again at what's in here and how they can adjust it uh, in a way that might be more amenable. Um, so I think they are doing the job that they were asked to do. We might not like what it looks like right now, and that's why I think you need to keep talking to them and letting them know what you want to see and don't want to see, and the same with us. Um, but I don't think we're at the point where we should be doing a lot of finger pointing, from up here at least. All right, so 
what I understand the motion would be um, the town council to request school department provide a detailed summary inclusive of the budget actuals 2019 through 2025, with, um, also including the ESSER, all ESSER funds and expenses detailed. detailed. Medicaid detailed. All ESSER funds and expenses, including details, and all Medicaid reimbursements and expenses, detailed. And all fund balance. Yes, and, and, all, and all fund balance. And the stipulation on the budget to actuals that it's the original budgeted amount from when the budget was well, submitted? Well, I think that's understood. It's... Okay. <laughs> we, I think if we don't spell it out, it's going to come to us with a totally different number. So, so the, imp the approved budget. The, the original approved budget, budget on the start of the thing. Not like six months down the line when they said, hey, we'll just change this budget no, number to this budget No, it's the budget, budget that was presented at the beginning of the budget. Yes. The budget season. Um, I'm going to have to read. We're going to have to write some letter for me and also an email for me. Do that tomorrow. All right, so that is the motion. Does everyone agree? Do I have um, second? Okay, so Mike made Mike Brock made the motion. John Edwards made the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Hooray! Thank you, everyone. I'm going to take like a five-minute break for a minute. Oh, I didn't know that was coming. Five minutes for a minute. Five minutes for a minute. <laughs>
All right, so I'm going to let one question be asked, even though I went beyond the topic. Um, and I do want, and I think it's about what I just said, what we just talked about. Okay, uh, go ahead. Sort of. Um, he wants so, to ask a question, too, I think. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> <laughs> They're really tired. Um, it's been a rough couple of weeks. All right. We're all taking the hit. Uh, so the question that I have is just regarding clarification as to why things have become so incredibly dire over the past five years specifically. So I went to high school here with Sean, actually. We graduated together 20 mm -hmm. years ago, or is it more than that now? No, um, uh, 20. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go on. In the summer. Um, okay, so... <laughs> And we had budget issues back then. Um, so budget issues are not new. I think we can all acknowledge that. But what I'd like some clarification on is why, and this is one of the first things that our superintendent made very clear uh, that first night that he spoke to us, I think it was the 12th. Mm -hmm. He said, over the past five years, um, things have, it's, it's almost, he equated it to a snowball effect right. type Think of a situation. Right, what's happened in the last five years. A new superintendent came aboard. That's all I, that's what I have to say. If you look at what we gave them five years ago and what we're giving them now, you're not going to believe the increase we've given them. We, we did the math the other day. So that's what happened five years ago. A new superintendent came aboard who, um, I, 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 <laughs> who has just gone rogue, it, that's what I want to say. He's gone rogue, and no one has kept him in line. And I'm not blaming any specific person, it's just he needed to be watched more carefully than he's been watched. That's my answer to okay, that. Okay, I appreciate I that. also want to, I also, and tomorrow, boy, are we going to get crucified for everything we're saying tonight. <laughs> um, I also want to say, um, we want to apologize as far as the affordable housing is concerned, it was just clarified to us that there is a law in effect. So if an abandoned school, um, if, if a school is abandoned for six months, then the state has the right to turn it into affordable housing. I don't, I don't know if it's six months, but I'll give you the site. It's, 40, well, it's 45, 24, 37, subsection well, H. We just, it was it, six months, wasn't it? I, I, I don't think it's... it's a, all right, that's the six months. Correct. So they're looking at us now, by the way, guys. So but, we're already under the radar for uh, low-income housing. I don't want you to think for we still have to pay that loan. They could take it over and make it affordable housing. We're still responsible for that loan, and we went through the ratifications of that tonight. But I want to apologize. I wasn't aware of it. It was just brought to my attention. 455310. And you're going to send it to me, correct? Thank you. Okay. And I'll have a copy, and if you want, I can post it on one, one of the sites that we've got going. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so essentially, um, there's really no we, real explanation as so, to why enro en enrollment has declined over the past you have uh, to ask five years by around 15%, yeah. oh, um, no. yet... As we've continued to receive uh, an increase, a budget increase for the schools of 25 percent, um, and now, now they're looking for 35 yeah. uh, in total. Is I'm that, a little is, off does that topic, sound correct? and I could get in trouble for all of this. <laughs> What's that? I'm off topic right now. A lot of these questions, and as much as we'd love to answer them for you and research them for you, it's the school committee that you need to ask these questions to. We intend to. And get an answer. I mean, we can answer it, but there's nothing we can do. It's, it's yeah. unfortunate, but there's really nothing we can do at this point, except give them the increase that we feel is appropriate right now. Okay. Okay. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. All right, so we're going to... No, I can't let anybody else talk. Nope, sorry. Um, we are skipping over C, because Kodak is not. Uh, they had an emergency tonight. They could not make it. Okay. So they, they asked to reschedule in two weeks. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll put it on the agenda. Administrator Carter, Vice President Burke, 
presentation from Rhode Island Ready regarding possible business park development. And this poor gentleman has been sitting through this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Tell us what you think of the schools. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a Tiverton resident, so oh, you I, are? I appreciate okay. being here. Thank you. I actually, so my name is Bob Sykes. I work for a park corporation, and I've been asked to attend this evening to, to inform the council about the Rhode Island Ready Grant Program. Um, so it's a statewide industrial site readiness program managed by the Quonset Development Corporation. Um, the program provides funding through a $40 million general obligation bond that was approved by voters in 2021 uh, with the purpose of job creation, increasing tax revenue, and uh, encouraging private investment within the state. So the program is divided into two buckets. Uh, the first bucket is technical assistance. It provides grants to municipalities and industrial site owners um, for engineering assistance to pre-design and pre-permit these sites um, to make them more appealing to industrial tenants. Uh, so those services can include surveying, wetland delineation, uh, geotechnical investigations, site engineering, uh, permitting uh, to activate underutilized industrial uh, parcels within the state. And then uh, the second bucket is capital assistance, uh, which is in the form of a forgivable loan or to a municipality, it would be in the form of a grant uh, to help construct some of these infrastructure improvements to, to activate um, underutilized industrial properties also. And that can be uh, in the form of, you know, in, in widened roadways, um, extensions of roadways, extensions of uh, utilities, uh, increased utility capacity uh, to help service those underutilized industrial areas. Um, so eligible sites uh, include industrial sites um, for new industrial use that can accommodate 100,000 square feet or greater um, or existing industrial uses that are proposing uh, significant expansion or potentially in, in the municipality's case here uh, for the design and construction of infrastructure to service uh, an existing industrial district or parcel. Um, so requirements for an application for the grant uh, include that the, the land must be industrially zoned. Um, it requires municipal support. So a letter from the chief executive officer of the municipality, which would be the, the town administrator in this case, a uh, certificate of authorization that proves that the municipality has authorization uh, and site control to submit um, to participate in the program, and then a $1,500 ap uh, application fee to the Quonset Development Corporation. Um, which was part of the, the vote in 2021 that they managed this $40 million bond. Um, the capital application is a little bit more extensive, uh, and it requires that the, the infrastructure be fully designed and permitted um, prior to submitting. But there are some other um, documents that are required. You need to do an economic impact assessment. Um, there needs to be uh, schedules. and. The, the application for the grant is a one-page document. It's very straightforward. It's, it's relatively, it, we, we compare it to a letter of interest. The application for the, the capital, where the, the construction dollars are, are far exceed the, the $200,000 grant amount, um, they can be upwards of a million dollars for the construction. Um, the, the application is a little bit more extensive for the capital piece. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to open it up if you have any questions. Um, but I'm here. Um, so, sounds like this is perfect for Tiverton, right? I mean, apart from yes. Quonset, really, it's Tiverton's industrial park is the only other site, really, in the state, as far as I know, right? Um, so, what the question I have is, um, I'm assuming, since you work for PAR and we uh, do contract with you guys, yes. uh, that you would be able to assist us in going forward with this, or is it strictly just on the municipal side? Um, so... We, we help oversee the grant. We actually have, we have four consultants. So first you, you would submit an application to the program. Um, PAR would review the application for completeness. We'd review your site for development feasibility to ensure that there's no constraints, um, whether it be encumbered, the title be encumbered, there'd be you know, significant wetlands, uh, environmental hazards, anything like that. Um, once we finish our feasibility review, we make a recommendation to the QDC board um, they vote that your parcel is enrolled in the program, and then once your your site or district is enrolled in the program, you're you're eligible for that grant of two hundred thousand dollars. And we have four consultants that are contracted within the program: um, Depre Engineering, BHB, uh, Crossman, and Time Bond. Uh, so we would, depending on who has experience, I believe Depre has actually worked on this site in the yep. past. So we would likely partner you with Dupree and scope the services uh, coordinating with the town. So quick follow-up, um, Madam President, how 
quickly can we get this on the next <laughs> agenda to get moving? It's fine in two weeks. Love it. Thank you. Uh, done. Um, done. Oh. <laughs> um, a couple things. Um, thanks for waiting tonight and coming back. Of course. Because um, I know you presented to the Economic Development Commission and it was at their request and the North Tiverton Committee's request that they come before the count you come before the council and present it to the council. Um, in terms of PAR, you're working for Quonset right now because you have done work for us as well. But yes. this is under your work with Quonset. Um, is there any point with either one of these uh, stages, if you will, um, where the town relinquishes rights to Rhode Island Ready or Quonset in terms of what goes in there? Um, no. So everything aligns with the town's municipal zoning ordinance. Um, there would be no proposed deviations from your permitted use table. So if it's agreed upon and approved by right within your permitted use table, um, then it would be allowed there and would need to zoning approval. Um, it is a, it's a speculative, pre-engineered, pre-permitted uh, site. Right, so the, the intent is that we design, uh, in, in this case, we've identified that there's a gap in the market for, for 10 acre industrial pro properties and a very low vacancy rate in the state. So we would work with the town to identify the appropriate um, subdivision layout to accommodate this, right? And pre-engineer and pre-permit those sites without knowing the use um, so that they could have the state approvals and the municipal approvals for the maximum industrial yield on that property. Now, when a potential tenant comes forward, they would still need to go and in, in get a building permit, which would require your zoning officer to sign off that it is a permitted use. And then any deviations from that pre-permitted site plan would still need to go back for approval. All right. And the, um, for the capital grant, the economic impact, is that something that can be done through the technical assistance? It is. Okay. Yes, we have actually, we have a consultant, uh, AECOM, that does um, economic impact assessments and then municipal service assessments also. So uh, there's an agreement process that we can get into the details, and it does require a town council vote, so I'll likely be back. <laughs> um, but we would, we would report to you the economic impacts, any potential impacts on municipal services, uh, that would be generated by these industrial uses. Um, and then we'd also present to you the, a, a conceptual site plan, essentially, of what, what we would be moving forward with within the program. And since you're a Tiverton resident, you probably know that we have two different water authorities yes. and a sewer authority. Yes. Would you work in, you know, collaborate with them on any all this? Yes, we would. As part of that municipal service assessment, <laughs> we'd conduct interviews with the department heads of the water authorities and sewer authorities to identify any any potential um, constraints with utility capacity, so, and understand those potential upgrades. But those upgrades are also eligible within the program for engineering and capital assistance to help. Uh, utilize these industrial properties. Right. Um, I know we have at least one person who wants to comment, but um, I would, you know, reason that the Economic Development Commission brought this forward, I think, and don't, if I'm saying off, um, was because, you know, we see that we've been trying to do something with this property for a long time, and um, we're not real estate agents. We don't have the capacity to build out the infrastructure or to do, we have some studies done, but I think a more thorough study would be helpful. So I think this allows us to do what some past councils wanted to do when they purchased this property, and it's been a white elephant for us for such a long time. I think that you know we do need to put this on our next agenda for um, decision. So Mike does most of the questions I had, but would your company then be involved in any of the marketing or help us with the marketing? Uh, so my company specifically would not be. Quonset Development Corporation would, and they are a subsidiary of Rhode Island Commerce who would also participate in marketing these, these parcels to potential tenants. They receive phone calls from industrial uh, users looking for 10-acre sites all the time. Hot commodity? There's not many of them. <laughs> okay.
Thank you. Some examples of who might want a 10 acre site. Not who, but what types? What types of uses? Um, yeah, I mean, distribution, production, manufacturing, it, there's a lot of different interested parties. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, I can, if I can say names of companies, but. Good evening, Karen F. from 74 North Christopher Avenue. Um, I have a lot of concerns about development efforts in general. Um, I would like to remind the town council of the letter that I wrote dated November 28, 2022, when North Point Development uh, Company had did a proposed development, um, and I reiterated those concerns at your December 14, 2022 meeting. Um, regardless of whatever development goes into this industrial park we do have currently in the town, um, I am concerned that whatever may be proposed, you know, as far as what Rhode Island Ready is um, offering, it just troubles me if you don't know what it's used, how do you build it out? How is it that we as the public truly understand what potential hazards they may be? in the development process in any companies that may potentially go in there. We are, that edge of that industrial park is approximately half a mile from a public drinking water source. If we don't know what's going in there, how can we do a full assessment and understand what could potentially go in there and could potentially impact our public drinking water? That's just one of many examples. And again, I ask you to refer back to the letter that I wrote on November 28th, 2022. When the project comes to us, we look at all of that. The town council. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are conscious of all of that. Like what, what is it gonna do to the neighborhood? What is it gonna do to the drinking water? And we do have limits to what we can do near a watershed area. So that's all taken in consideration. What happens then if whatever the process is, if say the process involves that land gets cut, uh, clear cutted, and then whatever gets proposed isn't going to be an, a project that fits due to whatever constraints because of the location, right? Because it's too close to a public drinking water source in order to proceed. What happens then? Done. Yeah, um, I just worth noting, right, we're talking about the industrial park. This is land that the town owns. So ultimately, we can go through this pre-permitting process. We can take these grant dollars, you know, get it ready because, I mean, we, we got to get it on the tax rolls, right? Um, and I think your concern is a valid one, like what's going to go in there. Ultimately, this, the town council is the one who's going to have to agree to sell the land to whomever mm -hmm. wants to build something. So if somebody were to come in and, you know, wanted their proposal was to put a, you know, giant nuclear reactor there or something, Highly unlikely the town council is going to vote to sell them the land before they even get to the building process. So it is our land. You know, like nobody's going to go in there and put a dump, for instance. Um, it has to fit within within what the PDP already says. Right. So, so there's multiple opportunities to get bites at the apple to prevent something crazy from going in there. Um, you know, first the council has to agree to sell the land, and then ultimately it has to go through a master plan and the zoning and whatever the cases may be, all those steps. And throughout that process, uh, certainly the public would be able to comment on the viability of, you know, what's being proposed. And quite frankly, we've had companies come to us and they haven't gotten past, we've said no. So I mean, there, there has been opportunities that where the company came and we were like, no, that's not gonna fit in there, that's not gonna be right for the environment, and, and we say no. So there has been companies that have come to us. M more so than you think. More so than you think. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have been particular in what we put there. Okay. And this, 
the last two councils are really the first ones that sold any land before. They gave it to the, they sold it to the power plant, and then nothing happened for a long period of time. And then we have sold it to four or five people since then. So we are making some progress and putting it on the tax rolls. So. Yeah, with the exception of, I think, the Longplex, I was on yeah, every one of those councils. Yeah. So, like, the self-storage and bill yeah, sales. Yeah. So um, it does come in front of the council. Uh, we do meet in exec, and we've had, we have had multiple – we've actually had offers this year that have that we been turned no. down. So, um, you know, it's good. It, I think, you, you know, unfortunately, because the disposition of land does have to happen in executive session because the council has to maintain a, you know, good negotiating position – um, you know, you just have to place you know some faith that your elected officials have your best interests. And it is zoned an industrial park, so. so. So yeah, the the underlying piece is in zoned industrial with the PDP, the professional development park on top of it. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that when North Point came in, they were also buying more land than what the town owned. Yeah. So there is still a fairly large buffer between the town's industrial park business park and your neighborhood area that that still is not certain no, no, I, I understand but it becomes how do we understand what kind of factors that we'd have to potentially look to you to mitigate such as decibel levels diesel trucks emit um, I don't remember I don't recall the exact decibel level but it's quite loud and you need a particular distance in order to have a safe distance between people who get exposed to that noise on a regular basis so they don't incur any type of permanent hearing loss. Oh. And again, it becomes very challenging. Well, we haven't sold it to anyone like that as of yet. So. Understand, you know, yeah, what we haven't sold it to there. anyone like that yet. So. Yes, and, and, the, it, and the project comes before us publicly when, when we finally present it. So. Um, I'm sorry, it's an industrial, it's zoned industrial. When that neighborhood was put there, the people that developed it knew that they were right against a zoned industrial park. So, and, and for what it's worth, right, the, right. the council does only, I mean, the council, the town, the town only owns the existing industrial park land. So, um, you know, you've got two water it. departments that own property in between your neighborhood and the industrial park and then there's you know another couple of parcels in between there so even if the town were to somehow magically have somebody show up and say hey we want to buy everything um the risk to your neighborhood is only in so far as like the water departments would have the ability to sell those lands and for what it's worth when it comes to the decisions the water departments make um Somebody said this to me a while ago. Uh, if you grab like six of your friends and show up at the board of uh, the board elections, <laughs> you're on the water department this. board. Like no one goes to those things. So um, it would be very easy to ensure that as long as you're a rate payer for that district, that nothing's going to happen there because you would be on the board and you would have the say as to whether or not those lands get sold. I know it's not sense. the answer you want, but it's going to be sold, and we're going to be very careful on who we sell it to, and we are we keep that neighborhood in mind. We appreciate that. Um, as a neighborhood, I'm sure I speak for all the fellow residents there. It's just I also get concerned about the wildlife, the environment. There's wetlands that are in there. Those are unique ecosystems. Well, those are not buildable, and we know that. There's certain areas that they can't build on. I know, but still, even if you build around it, you are still disrupting the environment. And, I mean, I again, know. they're unique ecosystems that we need to, as a society, value and But it was respect. zoned in an industrial area. And, and maybe it shouldn't have. I mean... Well, it wasn't us. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, well, thank you, and we'll keep everything you say in mind. Thank you. Where is that lady? Oh, why'd she leave? Okay. Maybe because she was. Um, no, Jimmy, you already talked. No, you already talked on it, and we're running really late now. We're already into overtime. Yeah, we're already into overtime for the maintenance people. No, you already spoke about this. We're going to put it on an agenda, and we'll get to talk about this again. It won't be a public hearing. And if I decide, 
we will have people. Yeah, well, I will. Jamie, there's not a public hearing on everything that comes no. before the council. No, you, we've, we've actually, Jamie, I think most of us understand where you're coming from this, on this. Yeah, I think we may not agree with you, and you would like us to agree with you, but we don't. So we're going to move ahead. We're going to move ahead. All right, I'm moving ahead. <laughs> All right, um, so I will put this on the next agenda. That's what, yep. okay. Councilor, Councilor Paul, discussion possible vote on Bacassett Cemetery Commission fee schedule increase. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think, <laughs> Poor guy. I think we did, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Paul. I'm really sorry. We're getting a little tired, I think. Council Paul, discussion possible vote on Bacassett Cemetery Commission fee schedule increase. In the cost of mechanic, mechanical device and greens rental full body from 75 to 100. Full body. Full so, body. So go ahead. So, Madam what President, this is um, essentially housekeeping for the Cemetery Commission for their bylaws with their fee schedule. It's only one increase on their entire fee schedule, and they're requesting to go from 75 to 100. Um, the backup explains that. Yep. This is one of two devices that they own, and it's imperative that they keep them both in operating condition. Um, if one of them were to fail, it would make for a horrid burial. The cemetery commission. The yeah, Bob, Bob is here. Is waving his hand at me. Hi, Bob. Good evening. Um, at our last meeting, we were going over some of the. Um, fees and stuff, and we would like the uh, council to approve a cost of maintenance device and green fee uh, rentals for a full body from 75 to to $100. This fee has not been raised since 2008. So we are looking for yep. the increase. Madam Chair. Go ahead, John. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the increase as requested by Councillor Paul and the Cemetery Commission. Second. Second. A question this doesn't require advertising. Yeah, we're increasing fees, so this, yes. Um, Does this not require advertising? Would this be a public hearing? I, I, I thought the, uh, the ordinance gives them the authority to um, set their fees. Well, we talked about it at the agenda meeting, but that seems like years ago. Subject, subject to uh, council approval. Okay. Hold on. Okay. So motions. Yeah, Second okay. If, you could, if, it, if we have to do it over, we'll, we'll do we'll it again. But I think, it. I think they set their own fees. Well, we talked about it at the agenda yeah. meeting. Yeah. Okay, motions remain and seconded. All those in favor? Yeah. And then the next one is discussion and possible vote on amendment to Picasso Cemetery Commission. Bylaws re regarding burial delays, and this had to be explained to me okay, during this is a, the meeting because I wasn't quite this sure. This is a new rule that we'd like to put into effect. Um, we ran it by the solicitor yep. and and stuff like that. So um, basically, we had an issue a few months ago with the water, mm -hmm. with just ground being saturated. Um, getting the machinery in there is pretty heavy. Uh, getting our soft ground. It uh, did a little, not some minor damage. We we're lucky this time. Um, we did try to contact the funeral home and they agreed to postpone it. However, the family uh, was against it. So basically we had to do it. Um, so we're looking for down the road. Uh, if this ever happens again, we'd like to have a clause put in there where um, I believe you have a copy of it. Yeah, it says if a burial cannot be completed due to inclement weather or other conditions that may lead to damage to the cemetery, including but not limited to ground, headstones, or other structures within the cemetery, the superintendent, in collaboration with the chairman of the cemetery commission, may postpone a scheduled burial provided 48 hours. Advance notice is provided to the funeral home and um, the family. So this is in severe wet. This, this will not happen often. Snowstorm. Snowstorm. Blizzard. Madam President. Again, anything, anything, if, if the burial cannot be completed due to inclement weather, which could be Hurricane. blizzards, hurricanes, right. whatever, 
Um, but not just a little rain. Right. I just want it's, not to know rain. That. it's not only rain. It's not only rain. It's any type of inclement weather. Go ahead, Dave. All right. So I, when I attended their meeting, there's there's a safety aspect here as well, with the amount of rains and the volume of rains and the and, and the periods of rains we've been getting. The ground is getting so saturated that it's not just the equipment itself that's causing damage. There's actually a real fear here that if they were to hold a graveside, that the ground itself would cave in. As crazy as that sounded, it actually happened in Barrington a few years back, and it sent some people down with it. So they're trying to prevent an accident from happening and making sure that the ground is stable enough for the equipment and for the burial. Madam Chair. Yep, and then oh, you. sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I just have a quick question. This is the first time this ever happened? This is the first time it's happened in 30 years that we know of. Okay. Now, what about the ground is so frozen you can't dig? There's, well, I mean, in the past, they, we, we rent heaters and stuff that can thaw out the ground and stuff okay. like that. Um, and there are some places, as long as we're digging um, on a hard surface, like a road or something, we can still go through with this. But it's sometimes a lot of them now are in the back where you have to drive this equipment over um, you know the roads and over some areas. other so yeah. you know this is just something that when the superintendent and and the chairperson get together uh, and basically as a chairperson right now I would listen to the superintendent because it's his machinery it's his responsibility yeah. and you know basically he knows what he's doing over there he's the expert in this but this is just something that in case something happens again like this it may never happen, but in case it does, you we have, have some yeah, type have of right. um, rule in effect that we can postpone it. Okay. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, okay. Motion to approve the amendment as set forth. Can I just make uh, well, we, we, we have to vote on ENF. We just kind of. Could I just make a comment? I'm sorry. The, uh, the language in the resolution or the oh, request to change omitted the word 48 hours. The original, it says, and the original one, it says, my email says 48, but the, the, the uh, explain the nature of the request doesn't have it. On, on yeah, the but I, we have 48 okay. here. Okay. I'm talking about the cover. But the cover doesn't The cover page is, so I just want to make sure it says 48 hours. Yes, That's it does. All. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. Any second. further? Did someone second it? Second. Motion to assume. Hey, I, I made the motion. Yeah, sorry. My apologies. Motion, yeah, it's getting. Most, motion's been made and second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. DPW Director Rogers' discussion possible vote to approve sufficient funds to allow the town administrator to sign and submit the RIDOT Municipal Road and Bridge Program FY25 participation form. Thank you. So, DPW does request that the the town administrator be allowed to uh, sign that form, and if there's any questions, uh, happy to answer them. Madam President. Yes, John. Uh, motion to uh, approve uh, the town, administ uh, town administrator's signature on the uh, RIDOT Municipal Road and Bridge Program FY25 participation form. We have a second. Any discussion? Motion be made and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Is this helping a little bit more, Jeannie, with the way the table is? Good. Thank you. You can thank Councilor Burke. Council Vice President Burke, discussion and possible vote advertised request for proposal for hiring professional engineering and consulting services for the harbor management plan. To be here, but anyway. If you want to table it. We no, 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 no. I, I don't think we need to. Um, so. The Harbor Management or Harbor Commission is very close to having a Harbor Management Plan completed, um, but they felt very strongly that in order to provide the appropriate um, documents for uh, like the GIS mapping and, and um, the like that goes into the Harbor Management Plan, and I think you can see that. Quick question while you're yeah, go um, ahead. flipping through it. Um, this is just to advertise the RFP. We ultimately will have to vote on Correct. to accept. Okay, thank you. Yep. So if you look on page nine, and Chris, I don't know if they 
work with you on this or, or not already. So if we do approve anything, I would say, you know, with the directive of the town administrator. Um, so presentation of plans, maps, and appendices um, as determined by the Harbor Commission in the town and Coastal Resources Management as appendices. Um, again, it's all around plans, maps, topographic data, utilization, utility investigations, um, looking at existing records and the like, and being able to put those together in a more professional manner to um, attach to our mooring areas, to attach to our harbor management plan, which they have been doing. You know, it's taken a while, but they're close to the end. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve the um, RFP uh, and send that thing out. With any modifications? With any modifications, yeah, that the administrator deem appropriate. or the Harbor Commission yep. deems fit. Second. Motion remains. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, National Business Week proclamation, uh, Mr. Cotta. So they sent this out statewide for all communities to adopt the um, um, National Small Business Week as a form of resolution. So I put the draft before you. Uh, any, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'm happy to make a motion. I just want to make sure it's okay. uh, ex acceptable to the lawyer since it doesn't stipulate we're voting on this. Oh, doesn't it? Oh, it does not. Yeah. It, it just kind of says. So okay. yeah, it's next meeting because it's April 28th. Okay. So we can do it next meeting. So we'll move that, Jeannie, to next meeting. Thanks for catching that. I didn't, didn't see that. that. Um, Administrator okay. Cotta, discussion and possible vote to approve budget transfer request for, fis for fiscal year 2023-24. I am not going to read all those unless I really have to. Um, but they're what? As noted on the agenda. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve the budget transfers as noted on the sheet we were given. On the Second. End. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Not. Okay, moving on to the top of the next page. Discussion and possible vote to advertise proposed amendments to Town Code of Ordinances Appendix A, zoning regarding permissible zones for retail shops, testing cultivation and manufacture of recreational cannabis. Um, I'm wondering if, and, and Mike and I talked briefly about this, the Cannabis Commission is not even close to having their regulations ready, um, and there was only going to be four, I think four, if you, it zones? was limited, limited number of zones, zones that they would put them in. Um, so we might be able to table this until after the Zoning Review Commission um, does their work, but I'm looking so, at Yeah, that's up to the council. I, I, I will note that this really, um, we really need to, uh, if we're going to do anything tonight, we need to su submit this to the planning board for their, yeah. recommenda for their uh, advisor recommendation. I'm happy to go through it quickly if you guys want to, but it's up to you. Sure. Uh, as you know, the, the voters of this town approved, uh, one, uh, approved the, the, uh, the ballot measure, which gave the town's permission to have these type of centers and uh, retail shops within the community. Our zoning code is currently written, did not, does not allow it at all. So we, had to re, we have to uh, amend our zoning code to reflect uh, what I believe is the will of the voters. Uh, so the first part is the definitions of the various cannabis um, uh, uses, I guess, or businesses that were approved by, uh, but it comes from state law. Um, so it's a cultivator, a, a, a cannabis product retailer, and a testing laboratory. Um, if you then looked at the use table, we did not permit any of these the uses just mentioned as de defined except in the industrial park. Uh, specifically in the PDP only. Um, if you notice, however, I made it um, a condition, well, I made it either it's permitted as of right, or you could go get a special use permit. So uh, the first part of it is all these things would be permitted as a matter of right. So they could go in there tomorrow and do it if this was passed, or they would go to the zoning board for a special use permit. So I gave it to the alter alternative, and then I listed the, for the special use permit, I, I listed the alternative uh, criteria that they would have to meet. Um, and that's basically uh, it. So it's up to you if you want to table it or you want to go to, I think it Mr. might Mr. be a good Mr. idea, just my personal opinion, to at least give it to the planning board 
so they can give an advisory opinion, and then we then we have our own. We can take our own time to whether we pass okay. it or not. One of the issues that I think they should decide is, or at least recommend, is whether or not it should be permitted as a right or by special use permit. I want to make up make a, be very clear on one thing. Currently, under our ordinances, compassion centers are not allowed in any zone, um, and because of the vote, even though compassion center wasn't part of the original vote. I thought it made sense to allow compassion centers in this in, in the industrial PDP as well. So that's not required by the statute, but to me it didn't make sense to not have a compassion center, but you could have a retail shop. So, uh, so I'm going to make a motion. Uh, given the sheer um, volume of revenue this could produce, I would like to motion that we uh, go ahead and advertise uh, the ordinances as well as simultaneously send it to the planning board for their opinion. Kill two birds with one stone. I don't think you can do that until you get a recommendation first. Right. Right. Got it. All right, then my motion <laughs> amend my amend my motion to send it to the planning board. Thank you. They have, they have so many days to get back to us. So right. I have a second. Days. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Discussion possible vote regarding the town of Barryville's request to form a coalition to develop a joint resolution regarding an overhaul of the funding mechanisms and or other factors contributing to inconsistent funding and appropriate school, appropriate support for schools. Any discussion? If not, I'd like to entertain a motion. We, I just want to be, we're, are we? The, the thing is with this is they, I think they want a member of our council to join the coalition. Got it, okay. That's so ultimately, we'll have to appoint right, somebody. Because if you read it, yeah. we'll ultimately have to appoint someone. All right, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we, I guess, agree or reach out to Boroughville and tell them that we are interested in being part of this. Is anyone interested in being on this? If you're pointing at me, I figured it was coming. No, no I'll do it. <laughs> well, we, we, we could have one in an alternate. Love it. Okay. Um, I'm but, just, but we'll discuss that then. But I just. I got, I got three small kids. It's, you know, yeah, time, time, well, is, time is tight. I'm in the middle of negotiations. If we, if, if they could do it via Zoom, I'm all in. Well, that's what I was thinking. So, all right, so I have a motion and a second. Who seconded? Did someone second, second. it? Okay. Yeah. Motion and second. All those in favor? Okay. I'd like to entertain motions to go into executive session. Assistant Town Solicitor Romano, or on General Law 42-46582, Town of Tivoli MV, Longplex and Tivoli Zoning Board of Appeals, NC 2023-0036, litigation update. Town Administrator, Rhode Island General Law 42-46582, collective bargaining update on TVC's Local 251 negotiations. <coughs> Town Administrator, Rhode Island 42-46582, a collective bar bargaining update on IBPO number 406 negotiations. Town Administrator, Rhode Island General 42-46-5A-2, collective bar bargaining update on IAFF Local 1703 negotiations. Council President De Medeiros slash Administrator Carter, Rhode Island General Law 42-46-524, any investigation pro 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 proceedings regarding allegations of misconduct either criminal, civil, police, school, department. Town Administrator, Rhode Island General Law 42 <coughs> litigation, potential litigation regarding North Tiverton Fire District and Tiverton Wastewater District. Do I have a motion? So moved. Yes. Second. No yeah. second. Go ahead. Yes. 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 We're now in executive and we're paying overtime. 